Good morning. Well, welcome to the parking lot service. <laughs> We're going to do some songs for you this morning. A couple to get started and warm me up a little bit. But I like Steve with the top down. <laughs>
Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Good morning! <laughs> Always. <laughs> All right, so we have some announcements for you today. Number one, if you are visiting today, please complete the visitor form found in your handout and put it in the offering basket after the service. Also, those in need of the um, those in the church family, you can use those forms to update your information if you have anything new information-wise to give us. There is a survey also to be completed in that packet that you received today. Please fill that out and put those in the offering bl- plate baskets at the end of the service on your way out. Number three, this Wednesday is Food Pantry. If you would like to volunteer to help with that, please contact Bob Smith. Number four, the wait is over. We are having youth group this Wednesday in the form of a grill out under the pavilion. As we are transitioning back into meeting together, this Wednesday requires an RSVP so I can have everything set up accordingly. Distancing will be followed, but we are very excited to be together again. Middle school is meeting at 5.15, and high school is meeting at 6.30. Those are my announcements. So, I'm excited because at this point, um, we are going to move into the graduate recognition portion of the service. So, if you are a graduate, you may make your way up towards the front, and once I call your name, you can come on stage and receive a card from Kathy. Russ is going to be up here as well. Okay, Lori Davis graduated from Lock Haven University with a Master's of Health Science through the Physician Assistance Program. Jared William Dickey graduated from Columbia College Chicago with a degree in Interactive Arts and Media 2D Animation. We will honk at the end, have no fear. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Kelsey Irene Kuntz graduated from Lock Haven University with a Master's of Health Science through the Physician's Assistance Program. Cassie Legeman graduated from Penn State University with a Bachelor of Science in Science. Michael Moldovan graduated from Grove City College with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical and Computer Engineering. Tiffany Muffler graduated from Shippensburg University in Social Work. Madison Peters. Come on up. She graduated from Elmira College with a Bachelor of Arts. Emma Rohan graduated from Penn State University with a Bachelor of Science in Education and Public Policy and a Master's in Educational Theory and Policy. Sarah Rohan graduated from the University of Washington with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science through the Navy ROTC. Cameron Smith graduated from Bald Eagle Area High School. Come on up. (laughs) And Rachel Weigel graduated from Penn State University with the Bachelor of Arts in Criminology. Okay, so you guys know we are in the middle of a crazy season and we had so many incredible people graduate from such hard work that they have put in in high school and college and we are so proud of them so do not hold back let's give them a big honk honk of applause <laughs> yeah a plus i see you don <laughs> a plus well we're so excited for you guys congratulations and thank you for attending our graduate portion of the ceremony Oh, yeah, we're going to pray over them. (laughs) Thank you, Russ. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, uh, you are working, and it's really beautiful to see how you uh, 
um, deliver your people and how you walk with us through things. Um, so thank you for this moment to recognize graduates who have put a lot of work in, who have worked hard, who have um, worked long hours, and who have just continuously um, poured into their work. God, it's, a, it's an honor to recognize them for that work, and we are so excited to see what you have planned for their lives as they pursue their um, further education, as they pursue their careers, as they pursue families, as they pursue whatever you have in store for them, God. We are so excited, and, and we know that you will meet them in those things. God, we pray your blessing upon them, that you will just guide their steps, that they will be so um, in tune with your heart, that they will just know what direction you would have them go and how you would have them serve your kingdom. God, we are so thankful for this time to be together, um, bumper to bumper, just praising your name, honoring you, worshiping you. Thank you for all that you are. Thank you for all that you do. And we love you. Amen. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for your harm, to give you a hope with give you a future with hope. Then, when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me, if you seek me with all your heart.
hardly speak.
we have already been blessed here this morning. Amen? I invite you now to join me as we go to our Father, our Creator, our Sustainer in prayer this morning. We do have several requests this morning that have been made known to us, and we will be remembering them this morning. So if you will now please bow your heads and uh, just join me in prayer to our God. Heavenly Father, you are a God of truth and justice, and yet, at the same time, a God of mercy and grace. It is truly amazing to us how you can establish both concepts of justice and mercy, but you have done this through your one and only Son, Jesus Christ. It is your sinless nature that guarantees us of your perfect justice. It is also your son's sinless nature, combined with the sacrifice that he made for us, that provides that pure and unconditional love that you have for us. You are holy and the creator of all truth. You are also love personified, and it is with the love of your spirit in our hearts that we come to you this morning with a song on our lips and our souls filled with awe and adoration for you. To think that you want to meet with us, just as much, if not even more, than we want to meet with you this morning, is something that brings great joy to our hearts. You are here this morning. May your spirit fill this place, and may your word have access to each one of us that have come to worship the Almighty. You have told us that we are righteous in your eyes, but we also know that we cannot take credit for this righteousness. The only reason we can approach you wearing spotless robes of pure white is because you have clothed us in the righteousness of Jesus, and it is his virtue, not that of our own, that covers us. The blood of the innocent has paid off the debt of the guilty. Father, each and every day we try to be more like you, but we are broken, living in a world that sometimes seems to thrive on sin and temptation. And just as Paul the Apostle said, sometimes we do not understand what we do. For what we want to do, we do not do, but what we hate, we do. Lord, because of this, there is not a day that goes by that we do not need your mercy and your forgiveness. For that reason, we come to you this morning to confess our sins to you at this time. Father, thank you. Thank you for once again extending your forgiveness to us. Thank you for being patient with us and for loving us even when we don't deserve it. Thank you for understanding when we think we know of a better way. Thank you that your plan for us will always be good for our good and for your glory. <clears throat> Thank you for sending your Son to save us and for sending your Spirit to teach us. Thank you for never leaving us nor forsaking us. Thank you that your love is unfailing, that it has never been shaken, and that your covenant of peace will never be removed. Thank you for your wisdom, and thank you for your compassion when we choose not to follow that wisdom. And thank you for meeting every single need we have. Even before we ask, you are answering prayers and altering the world around us to meet those needs. And Lord, your congregation here at the Blanchard Church of Christ has its share of needs. As a church family, we want to share in the joys and the concerns of each one of our brothers and sisters. Father, we thank you that Joby Carnahan is once again home from the hospital after spending several days this past week at Mount Nittany recovering from emergency appendix surgery. We understand she is still very sore, and we pray that you will be attentive to her as she recovers. Also, be with Rich and Elena as they minister to her. Give them the strength and endurance they will need at this time. Lord, we also ask that you be especially close to Tom Carson right now, as he is also a patient at Mount Nittany after suffering a stroke at home. 
It is good to hear that he may be transferred to Health South even as soon as today, but we also realize that he has a long recovery ahead of him. In addition to Tom, we ask for peace and for patience for his wife Barb as she eagerly awaits his homecoming. She is so lonesome without him right now, and it's even worse when she is not allowed to visit him at either place. Please let your love and your mercy envelop the entire family. We thank you for being with Jen Long and her family as she also underwent surgery for gallbladder this past week. She has appreciated all the ways her church family has reached out to her and shown the entire family how much they are loved. As she recovers and Larry and the boys see to her needs, we just ask that you will help them all in the coming weeks as Jen gets better and better each day. We thank you for protecting Zoe Horton this past week when she was involved in a serious car accident. While she did receive some extensive injuries, we know you kept her from further harm, and we are thankful that she is now back home after spending the night at Geisinger Medical Center. Lord, we also ask for a special touch for Rachel, Olivia, and Chloe Webb, who were involved in a severe accident in the past weeks. Father, all were life-flighted to Altoona, and Chloe had to be life-flighted to Pittsburgh with collapsed lungs. Father, we just pray that you are with each and every one of them and with their families, and that you are staying close to them and helping them with their recovery. Please be with Ricardo Morales as he prepares for knee surgery in the next couple of weeks. Let the surgery produce the results he needs to be without pain, and may his recovery be swift and complete. We also thank you that Yasinia's recent tests have given the doctors a better understanding of the health issues that, she's, that have been bothering her. Please give them the wisdom to know how best to treat her problem. Father, we ask that you will be with Todd Bittner's dad, Jim Bittner, as he is in the hospital right now, not doing very well. Father, we pray that you will not only be with Jim, but that you will also be with the entire family, for they are apart right now, and because of this corona pandemic that is going on, Lord, they cannot be together. They cannot visit each other. Father, that's got to be hard on a family. We just ask that you will be close to them, that you will give them the comfort that they need at this time. Continue to watch over Ben Fortescue as he also has tests and scans scheduled in the next couple of weeks. Let his test results bring him the peace and encouragement that he so desperately has been seeking. Father, it seems we have many in our church that are in one way or another touched by the terrible disease of cancer. Whether they are a victim themselves or have a loved one that is fighting this diagnosis, we pray that you will be in each situation and meet the needs of each one. Lord, for those that are currently in the hospital, we ask that soon they will be whole and be able to return home soon. Father, be with them right now as they are not allowed to have visitors. For those who have come home from the hospital after receiving surgery or some other type of treatment, we praise you for their return of strength and health. For those who are expecting the birth of a child, we pray for patience and peace as they wait for the blessed miracle of life to take place within their family. For those who have experienced this miracle recently, we ask that you bless the ch this child and the parents as we rejoice with them. Holy Father, please be close to our brothers and sisters who are not able to be with us this morning because they are either homebound, a resident of a nursing home, or someone joining us in worship of you online. May they be able to feel your presence and know that just because they are not with us physically, they remain close to us in our hearts. We ask for a special anointing on them. Father, for these requests and, and many others that may not have been mentioned, we pray for your blessing to be upon each and every individual, for them to feel your presence and for your peace to sustain. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the ability to come to you in prayer in this way. Your son taught his disciples how to pray, and to conclude our prayer, we recite the words that he imparted to them. Our Father, 
which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today would have officially been Promotion Sunday in all the Sunday school classes and the grades. And sadly this year, not only are the kids from 6th grade moving up to middle school, but also the kids from 5th gra grade, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. The kids that are going into 6th grade are moving up to middle school, but also the kids that are going into 5th grade are moving up to middle school. So we're still in the works of rearranging our programs and making a special time just for those kids, but in the meantime, know that you are always welcome. Welcome to join us in junior church, both the going into fifth grade and going into sixth grade. All right, so for the past few weeks, we've talked about Joseph and Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, and all of these men had something in common. They were all taken from a place of comfort and uh, placed in unfamiliar territory. They were all, they all endured hard work that was required of them. They all chose to make good decisions, even when faced with powerful temptations or horrible consequences consequences. They all won favor with people in authority over them and were all promoted to positions of high esteem. And best of all, they all served the one true God and gave him the glory in all of their circumstances. So I decided to give a promotion speech of sorts using three very important lessons that we gain from these Bible heroes to remember as you move on to middle school or up into another grade. Here we go. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation with prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, all of these Bible heroes were captured at an early age and taken to a foreign land. You know, going to middle school or to a new grade can be a little scary sometimes. You may or may not have your closest friends with you. And so look at this as an opportunity to make even more friends. Uh, but choose your friends wisely because they can make a big difference in how you will succeed. So be bold. Be the first one to reach out to make a friend. Remember our COVID verse? Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Lesson number two. Colossians 3.23 says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as if working for the Lord, not for man. These heroes of our Bible all worked hard and earned the favor of those placed in authority over them. You all will be facing new academic challenges in both middle school and with each higher grade. Study and work hard right from the beginning. Sit in the front and not with people who will distract you. Be friendly to your teachers and all of those who are placed over you in charge of you. After all, you represent God. Self-control is a very important fruit of the Spirit. And if you practice it in your younger years, it's much easier to, as you grow older and face temptations, to use it. So remember, live and work for God. People are watching you. So let your actions point them to God. And lesson number three. Genesis 1.27 says, God created man in his own image. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor male, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. These heroes' actions pointed to God in everything they did and to everyone they encountered. So when you go to middle school or to a higher grade, it's likely that you're going to have people in your class that may look different from you. For example, they may have a different color of skin, or the clothes they wear may be different, or they might be really rich or really poor, or maybe they come from a different country entirely, or maybe they have some sort of disability. But remember this, God made them all in His image. Sing along if you remember this song. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. 
everyone is precious in his sight. Everyone is made in his image. So treat everyone like you would want to be treated. Be kind, be respectful, be like Jesus. Let your actions and how you treat people point others to Jesus. So maybe you can dare to be a Daniel or a Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, or a Joseph in your new school, in your new grade. Maybe you can be courageous and bold in your faith. Maybe you can work hard at everything you do as if working for the Lord. Maybe you can treat everyone with love and respect and kindness and let your light shine in a dark world that so desperately needs people like you. God has great plans for you. So may he grant your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. Do you remember our verse that we've been learning? Romans 8:28. For all things work together for good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And so, as this chapter of your lives comes to an end, and you are looking forward to the future God has for you, I will close with Isaiah 61. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord will rise upon you. Until next week, stay safe. Good morning again, Blanchard Church of Christ. Good to see everybody out this morning. What a glorious Lord's Day this is, amen? Amen. I'd like to share with you a uh, communion meditation this morning. Communion is a symbolic way to show we belong to Jesus and to remember what he did for us. We're forgetful people. So it is in rem regular remembrance and celebration of the Lord's sacrificial death. The breaking and the eating of bread has to do with Christ's body being broken on the cross. The drinking of the cup has to do with the shedding of his Christ's blood, wherefore we are forgiven. That's in Matthew 26, 26 to 28. And also 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 24. Communion was originally celebrated by God's people as a promise of his protection during the Passover, and that's Exodus 12. When Jesus redefined, then he redefined it. The celebration of Pas Passover. As he and his disciples gathered to eat, remember the purpose of Passover, Jesus made a new promise. He took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Jesus promised to spare us from eternal death and cover our sins by his own blood, breaking his body and pouring himself out so that we, we will, and we do believe. We can have a relationship with him forever. The promise offered as a protection from Passover was a dim reflection of the great promise Jesus had made and fulfilled. Yes, it was his destiny, a promise of life forever. Let's pray. Holy God, this morning as we are assembled here, we are your people. We look at your majesty all over the world. Father, you've made it. Father, but we have messed it up in some way. Father, we pray for your strength. We pray that we may go back to God. We pray that we will fulfill your will. And Father, know that as, as we are, we, we fail and we're frail. But Father, you strengthen us. You strengthen us. And it's the strength that we look forward to. And it's, that's the cross. The cross before us, the world behind us. And Father, I know that with God, we will not fail. And God, this world needs a God, needs a Christ. And it was his prophecy, your prophecy, and his destiny that he would be the Lamb of Calvary. He hung on the cross. This blood was shed for all humanity, 
all humanity forever and always for all sin father we thank you so much for jesus so as we take of this cup another spread this look in ourselves inward and outward are we measuring up to your will father we love you and you love us that's why we're here in christ's name we do pray amen to worship with you today. Uh, I do want to add one more graduate to, uh, as we honor graduates this morning, I want to extend congratulations to Tanner Spangler who graduated uh, from Penn College and we wish graduation blessings to him and to his family. So I imagine that many of you are familiar with the show Duck Dynasty and his patriarch Phil Roberts. Familiar with him? Uh, I recently heard a short message from him on video. And as he began his message, he was in a boat on a river. And let me summarize what he said. He said this, This current virus is just like water. The water comes up and the water goes down. Human beings want it to shine every day, to have a life with no storms. Well, we're not going to be here long. And while we're here, if you have it in your head that you'll never have any trouble, you're dreaming. There will be trouble. And what is a person to do? I walk with God. Therefore, I am never alone. There are a lot of people who are afraid. Is it possible? They forgot that God is their refuge. And are they trying to make it without God? God says, I will be with him. I will be with her in times of trouble. I will deliver them and honor them with long life. I will satisfy them. I will show them my salvation. All that is required is that you love God and that you love your neighbor as yourself. He's exactly right. That is the message our nation needs as it continues to address this pandemic and as it continues to address racism and the violence and the looting and the civil unrest in our cities. When you love God and when you love your neighbor as yourself, you will see people as sacred regardless of race or age or gender or disability or economic situation. When you see people as sacred, you will not harm them. You will not destroy their property. You will not destroy their community. You will not say demeaning and ugly things to them. Instead, you will treat them in the manner that you want to be treated, with dignity and respect and self-control and restraint when you disagree with them. Crisis reveals character. In times of crisis, we discover the foundation on which we have built our lives. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. As we think about our young people, and as we honor our graduates with the backdrop of these current crises that our nation is experiencing, I want to talk about a sure foundation a foundation that will stay secure when you are stuck in the middle of the storm. The apologist Ravi Zachariah, and he, by the way, he just passed away last month, and he will be missed. Last week, I watched a video recording in which he made this statement. He said, The foundation on which you build your life is the only thing that will stand when the storms of life come. Let me repeat that. 
the foundation on which you build your life is the only thing that will stand when the storms of life come. And he went on to say, ultimately, they will come. It's not a matter of if, but when. We have witnessed a number of storms this year, beginning with this biological, social, and economic damage that has been done by this virus, and with that, the physical and relational and economic destruction and the death of George Floyd and the riots that followed. These are spiritual struggles. They are struggles between good and evil, right and wrong, and the strain and pain of living in a sinful world. And these are not the only storms that we'll face. There will be many, many storms throughout life, and you might find yourself stuck in them for a period of time. And when these storms hit, and they've ripped and torn at you at all angles, from top to bottom, and they've taken everything from you that they can, the only thing that will remain standing, or the only way you will remain standing, is if you have built your life on a firm foundation. If you have built your life on a firm foundation, and if you have not built your life on a firm foundation, this world, watch out. It will swallow you up. It will mock you. It will steal your innocence. It will laugh at your face, and it will not care. And you can sit there feeling sorry for yourself, but this world will not care. It will roll right over you, then it will back up and roll right over you again. And so you will need a firm foundation. And where are you going to get that? Let's look at three short verses from God's Word. The prophet Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 6 through 8. You're welcome to read along. A voice says, cry out. Now, this is an unidentified voice, but this voice has been sent by God. And I, Isaiah said, what shall I cry? The voice responds, All people are grass. Their consistency is like the flower of the field. The grass withers. The flower fades. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely people are grass. The grass withers. The flower fades. But the word of the Lord will stand forever. So what's standing? What's the firm foundation? The word of the Lord. Everything, everything in this life is fading. Your car is fading. Your home is fading. Our church building is fading. Your money is fading. Your parents are fading. Your children are fading. Your grandchildren are fading. And it's if to mock us, the tombstones above the graves of our loved ones, those stones are also fading. Don't tell your child Son, daughter, when the storms of life come, I will always be there for you. That's not true. That's a lie. You and I, we are fading. We are dying. We will not always be there for them. There's only one sure foundation that's not fading. And that is God's word. And then we are long gone and six feet under. God's word will still be firm for our children and our grandchildren to comfort them, to guide them, and to direct them. Because these are the words of the living God who never leaves us and who never forsakes us. Young people, we want you to remain standing in the storm. So please, and I speak on behalf of your parents, don't build your faith on your parents. Don't build your faith on your grandparents. Don't build your faith on your pastor or your Sunday school teacher or your husband or your wife or your bestie because we're all dying and we're all fading. Instead, build your foundation on the word of the Lord because it never dies and it never fades. And when the storm is done, you might be beat up but you'll still be standing in fact when you're done with this life as you stand on God's word you'll be standing with Jesus in glory in the world to come as you build your life on the foundation of God's word there are four truths that 
you will come to know that will never change regardless of what's happening in the world around you. And these truths will help anchor you in the storm because these truths are embedded in the foundation of God's word. So here they are. Truth number one. When you make God's word your foundation, you will learn that every human life is sacred as every human life bears the image of Almighty God. God said, let us make man in our, in our image according to our likeness. We are more than flesh and biology. We are more than time plus matter plus chance, an accidental calculation of atoms whose purpose is to just propagate our DNA so that a better version of ourselves can come along and kick us to the sidelines of extinction. No, no. We are souls. We are souls created in the image of God. Our sacredness is not based upon extrinsic factors such as physical and mental abilities which tend to fade as we age. On the contrary, our worth is intrinsic in our essence as we are image bearers of the living God made in His likeness. So number one, when you build your life Build your foundation on God's word. You will understand that all humans are sacred, created in God's image, and we are to treat them so. But number two, when you've built your life on the foundation of God's word, you will also understand that you and I, we are moral creatures. And that distinguishes us from the wild beasts and that who live according to natural instincts and impulses. We do not live by impulses. We, we live by morality. You know, the events that we've witnessed these last two weeks demonstrate that relativism has absolutely nothing to offer us. Relativism looks at the tragic death of George Floyd, the destruction of public and private property, the attacks against law enforcement and law-abiding citizens, and says, there's nothing wrong with those things. They're all relative. Those are just a matter of opinions. So you like Coke, and I like Pepsi. You like blue, and I like green. Anarchists want to harm police officers. I want to protect police officers. And the relativist steps in and says, hey, who's to say who's right? I have no idea why they keep pumping relativism in our universities and the minds and hearts of our young people. Relativism only justifies racism and attacks towards police officers. We look at the loss of human life and the destruction of communities. We see that relativism has absolutely nothing to offer us. It's a bankrupt idea because it has no anchor in the ground. It has no line in the sand to say this is morally right and this is morally wrong. Racism, murder, the destruction of businesses and livelihoods and assaulting people is morally long wrong. And the relativist will never say that because the relativist doesn't believe that you are a moral being. God's word tells us that you and I are moral creatures. There is a moral compass inside of each of us to remind us when we have violated the moral law of God. And you can attempt to override your compass with alcohol or drug abuse or with busyness or education or sports or career or the pursuit of sexual conquest or fanciful narcissistic teachings that say you are the center of your universe, but you can never escape the biblical truth that you and I, we are moral creatures. And one day, we will stand before the throne of God and we will have to give an account for the lives that we did or did not live. So number two, when you build your foundation on God's word, you will understand that you and I, we are moral creatures. Number three, when you build your foundation on God's word, you will understand that you have a divine purpose. We read in Ecclesiastes, God has set eternity in the hearts of men. My wife, 
she calls it the God spot. Because God created us. He has put a special spot in our hearts, in the hearts of each of us that desire Him. And that spot hungers. It hungers to be filled with, with purpose and meaning that only He can provide. And what often happens is we try to fill it with everything else, don't we? With all of the temporary and fallen pleasures of this world, with all the broken promises and lies that this world tells us. We try to fill it with degrees and education and money and fame and sex and relationships and entertainment and yet we still find ourselves wanting. Why? Because that spot in our hearts will remain restless until it has been filled with the only thing that can satisfy it. And that is God. And once you fill that with God, then you find meaning. Then you find peace. Then you find fulfillment. Then you find your security. So number three, when you build your foundation on the Word of God, you will understand that you have a divine purpose. And finally, number four, when you build your foundation on God's Word, you will, you will realize that you were made for eternity through Jesus Christ. I sure hope we get a cure for this virus. I sure do. But Phil Roberts is right. In the end, we're all going to die. Cure or no cure, we are still going to die. Only Jesus Christ is the cure of death. He is the resurrection and the life. And so we come up with a cure for our virus. Woohoo! Woohoo! It will still be tragic if we stand before the throne of God without Jesus Christ. On that day, we will need Jesus because we're all sinners. We're all guilty. We are all fall, fallen. And I just hope that we are as energized about sharing the cure, the spiritual cure for sin, as we are in finding the cure for biological stuff. Because we're talking about eternity here. See, as a preacher, part of my job is to encourage you and to build you up as you deal with the existential challenges in your life. But also my job is this, to prepare you for your dying day because on that day you will stand before the throne of God. And when you do, you will need Jesus Christ. We will all need Jesus Christ. All have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. We all know it. And how do we know it? Because we've all felt guilty. Guilt is that mechanism that we feel when we have violated a moral law of God. We are guilty. And now someone has to pay. It's not water over the dam. No, no, no. When something is broken, it has to be fixed. When the scales of justice are off, they have to be balanced and restitution made. That's why Jesus went to the cross. He made restitution for our moral debt so that you and I, we would not have to. So that we would not have to. We all need Jesus. He's the only way. He's the only one that can take the monkey of sin and condemnation off of our back so that we can be forgiven and so that we can be right with God. Number four, when you build your foundation on God's word, you realize that you were made for eternity in Jesus Christ. High schoolers, graduates, all of us, we're all fading Isaiah said, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. And when you are stuck in the storm, the only thing that will keep you standing both in this life and in the one to come is if you have built your life on the foundation of God's word. It never fades. And when you build your life on his word, you remember and you discover and you live by these four truths. Number one, every human being is created in the image of God. And we are called to, cre we are called to treat every human being as if that is so. Uh, number two, you and I, we are moral creatures. We will be held accountable for how we live our lives. But praise God for Jesus, because when we've fallen short, he'll give us grace. Number three, 
We have a divine purpose. We discover that when we allow God to live in our hearts. And number four, we were made for eternity. And Jesus Christ, he has made that possible. He is the lily of the valley. He is the bright and morning star. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. He has shown his love for us at Calvary. And he loves you. He loves our whole world. And he's not done. I know that you watch the news and it looks glim. But our Lord is on the march. He is still loving, still forgiving, still reaching out, still changing hearts. And one day he's going to come back and he's going to take this messed up world and he's going to make it right. Amen. I hope you receive him. He is he's the difference maker. God's word is our foundation and his word points us to Jesus Christ. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, reach out to us. Our contact information is on your flyer. I'd love to talk to you about what that means and, and what that looks like. It's really just it's asking Jesus to live inside of you and to receive his forgiveness and to ask God to forgive my sin through the blood of, of Jesus. And then we live for him. We honor him. But I would love to talk to you about that in person. If that's a decision you'd like to make, all of our information is on your bulletin. Please reach out to us. And I do. I hope you'll enjoy the blessing of the Lord this week. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we come before you. We can turn on the news. We can go look at social media sites and we can get discouraged really fast. Father, help us to get into your word. That's our foundation. That is our hope. Dear Lord, no matter how dim, how difficult things might look, with you all things are possible. And you're able to change things and redeem things and redeem lives and restore people and relationships. Our hope is there, Almighty God. We pray for our nation. We pray for our whole world, dear Lord. It needs peace. It needs love. It needs forgiveness. It needs grace and mercy, Almighty God. And we as Christians, we have the foundation of your word that has been built uh, on your divine heart, dear God. Your plan for us. If we would just follow your plan, there would be peace. There would be peace among all peoples as we give of ourselves sacrificially to each other, loving each other, lifting each other up. So help us to live out the gospel. This is the apologetic life. As we live, may our hearts, may our lives point others to Jesus Christ. We give you praise, honor, and glory. We love you, dear Jesus, in your name. And all the Lord's people said, Amen. Go in peace. God bless you. God bless you. Have a great week.